Angela Stolt was born on April 7, 1972 in Bangkok, Thailand to a military family. Her parents raised her in strictness, but with love and respect. As a child, she had problems with friends, as she was not very social and did not get along with her older sister Esther, who sometimes looked after her when her parents were away on business. When Angela was a teenager, her father retired from the army and they moved to Delton, Florida. There, at the age of only 15, she met a young man three years older than her, whom she moved in with and married. However, the relationship was not very good, as the girl told her family that in addition to being treated like a prisoner, her husband often beat her and even tried to take her life a couple of times. After several years of suffering, Angela divorced, but at the age of 20 remarried to another man with whom she had her first child around the same time she was diagnosed with an anxiety disorder and depression, so she started taking antidepressants. Also added to her problems with depression were other health problems. The fact that Angela was born without a thyroid gland, so she had to undergo many courses of treatment with various medications, which worsened the condition of her body and it became difficult for her to even walk. Around the same time, Angela's new marriage was again unsuccessful, so at the age of 23 she found herself alone with a child in her arms. In addition, she had no education as she dropped out of school in the ninth grade. Therefore, it was difficult for her to find a job to support herself and the child. Then she began to think that she needed to find a man who would support her financially. Because of this, at the age of 25, Angela remarried and from this union she had a second daughter. The new family moved to Volusia County, Florida. At first, the new marriage was going very well, but then Angela began suffering from panic attacks due to low thyroid hormone levels, as well as taking stronger medications that made her a little upset. Despite this, the woman worked hard to keep her house afloat and be more social with neighbors who thought she was weird. In 2006, James Skeefer moved in across the street from the house where Angela lived. James was a limo driver from Philadelphia. He was an affable and fun-loving man who had been in a relationship with a woman named Candy Medina for 17 years. She had one child from a previous relationship and two more from her union with James, who were about the same age as Angela's children. The children often played together and the family soon became good friends. They helped each other, went to parties together, and traveled. Angela loved to go camping with her children and was a big gun collector. She had all kinds of guns in her home. Some of them were decorative, but most of them were real. Although the guns were not loaded, she had ammunition for all of them. Despite her seeming happiness, this woman's marriage began to crumble, and one day her husband packed up his belongings and left for good. At first Angela was happy because, according to her, he didn't treat her very well, but she found herself in financial difficulty again because she was left alone with her children. Angela constantly asked her relatives to lend her money, but these loans were not enough. So in October 2012, her neighbor James proposed a financial assistance plan. She should become his beneficiary on his disability payments, which at the time amounted to $1,230 a month and in return, she could receive $100 a month to cover some expenses. At first, Angela refused because she didn't want to get in trouble, but he kept insisting until finally she agreed. They went to the Social Security office together and also to the bank where they opened a joint account for which James asked for a check to be cashed in advance. Apparently, the man started overdrawing the account, and although Angela tried to prevent it, her roommate found a way to get the card number and withdrew hundreds of dollars each month until it came to a deadline. At first there was no problem as James always paid, but Social Security began withholding a portion of his payments, causing him serious problems. He urgently needed a full check to pay off his debts, including several months' worth of rent arrears for the house where he lived with his family. James was desperate because he was about to be evicted and he expected to get more than he needed to pay his rent. Because of this, the man started pressuring Angela to borrow $4,000 from his father, but she didn't want to get him involved since he was already old and in poor health. By April 2013, the situation between them got even worse when Angela decided to cut off the check cashing advance. On April 3rd of that year, Angela and her neighbor agreed to meet to talk about money. So the woman, in the company of her children, picked James up early in the morning from work. When they got home, the children went to bed and she stayed with him in the kitchen to have a few drinks and discuss things. While they talked about the amount of money her father would lend her, Angela took the opportunity to add a painkiller she had stolen from her father to her neighbor's drink, knowing that it caused drowsiness, especially when mixed with alcohol. When James felt out of sorts, Angela drove him to the local cemetery. Once there, she stopped the car and they started talking. 
But when she told him that she had canceled the check cashing advances, the man became enraged and lashed out at her, demanding money. At that point, Angela took an ice pick she had in a box in the back seat of her car and stuck it in James' eye. But that didn't keep him down, so she took the rope and threw it around his neck. Later, when James stopped moving, she took the ice pick again and stabbed him in the other eye. When the man was already dead, Angela didn't know what to do. She thought about calling the police, but the thoughts running through her head told her that the police would never believe her, that she would lose her children. So she wrapped James' head in plastic wrap to avoid bleeding and to avoid dirtying the car, then drove home with his body in the passenger seat. After arriving at the house, Angela parked the car in the garage where she cut up the body with a knife and saw. She then brought the body parts into the kitchen and put them in the oven. But when smoke and an unbearable smell started coming out of the oven, she realized she might get caught and came up with another plan. Angela began cooking some parts on the stove and placed others in trash bags and dumped them in the woods behind the house with the help of her teenage children, whom she led to believe they were disposing of a deer she had run over with her car the night before. While Angela was disposing of James, his wife became concerned that he had not returned home after taking a client to Tampa and failing to show up for his next job. Candy then reported the man missing to police, who immediately appealed to the public for information on his whereabouts. According to information from police officials, James was last seen on April 2nd when he left his home. The missing person's flyers described him as a man about 180 centimeters tall, weighing 120 kilograms, with brown eyes and brown hair. As for distinguishing features, he had several tattoos, including one that read Gringo on his neck, the skull of the band Metallica on his right calf and NCC on his right forearm. Candy told detectives that her 16-year-old son Tyler had been receiving text messages from his father's cell phone saying he owed money to several people and needed to disappear. But the family questioned the disappearance and the veracity of those messages, since Candy and her children were financially dependent on James and believed he would never leave them. Investigators then went to the company where the man worked and found his van parked on the premises, but upon examining it, they found no evidence. James' boss, Pitt Harrington, told officers he didn't know where he was and that nothing unusual had happened at work. However, John, one of the limo's mechanics, told investigators he saw his co-worker get into a black car around 3 a.m. on the last day he was seen alive. According to the witness, James suffered from gambling addiction and had accumulated huge debts. John also admitted that they did not get along and had an argument a few weeks ago. But despite this statement, the police found no evidence linking John to James' disappearance and he was ruled out as a suspect. Using information from the GPS tracker and the limo James used for work, investigators visited all the places he had stayed during his last trip, but found nothing strange. To Detective John Brady, it appeared as if James had been swallowed up by the ground. Officers assumed that the man had actually disappeared to avoid facing debts. However, this was impossible for his wife, Candy, and she put intense pressure on the police to keep investigating, saying that her husband would never abandon her and the children to their fate. Over the next few days, while the police investigated, Angela continued to hide evidence by burying James' cell phone and driver's license in nearby parks. She also threw pots and pans into trash cans and tossed a rug from her car into a lake. A check of the missing man's cell phone records revealed that James had been texting a neighbor, Angela, who denied in a conversation with officers that she had seen him a few days earlier. When questioned again, the woman said she had been helping her neighbor with finances because he did not have a bank account and said she last saw him on April 5th, although family members had not seen him since April 2nd. As the days went by, Angela's behavior became more and more suspicious and she even started having nightmares. She began to suffer from paranoia as she stopped taking her medication. Detectives kept a close eye on her as they continued to work on the case, which took an unexpected turn. On April 20th, when the woman's sister called 911 to say that Angela was acting strangely, and she feared the woman might be trying to pass away, Esther told the operator that Angela had gone to her parents' home and told them she had committed a very serious crime and that she was being investigated. A police commission therefore immediately went to the woman's residence. However, by the time they arrived, Angela refused to talk to the investigators, even in the presence of a lawyer. She was then taken for a mental health evaluation. While the tests were being conducted, officers obtained a search warrant to enter her home. The house looked like a house of horrors. There was graffiti on the walls, strange religious icons, and dirty clothes strewn everywhere. Angela's bedroom was strewn with intimate objects and pentagrams. The detectives decided that the woman might belong to some kind of cult, so their suspicion of her was heightened. 
After several interrogations, Angela finally confessed to the crime and detailed how she had cut up James' body and cooked it. However, investigators needed to corroborate her story, so the woman led them to several locations in central Florida where she claimed she dumped the body parts in a wooded area in Austin. Officers found bones and body parts in trash bags, including a femur, kneecap, and some soft tissue, but no head or torso. They also found articles of clothing that matched what he was last wearing before he disappeared. Angela also took detectives to the location where she said she had buried James' cell phone. She noted that she periodically went there and put a battery in the cell phone to create the illusion that the neighbor was alive. Investigators hoped forensic testing would provide information on how Angela took the man's life, but the examiner in charge was unable to determine the true cause of death. DNA confirmed that the body parts belonged to the victim. After obtaining evidence and a confession, Angela was placed without bail in the Volusia County Jail. A deputy prosecutor charged her with second-degree murder, tampering with physical evidence, and abuse of a corpse. In September 2014, Angela's attorney filed a motion arguing that his client acted in self-defense under Florida law, but Judge Render Reuter denied the motion and sent the case to trial, which began on December 1, 2014. Prosecutors presented greed as a motive, arguing that as long as the Social Security Administration thought James was alive, monthly checks for $1,230 went directly into his account, which was Angela and James' joint account. Prosecutors also suggested that the defendant gave James medication and then took his life when he lost consciousness. They found that hours before the incident, Angela had bought plastic sheeting, which she used to wrap James' head with, and rubber gloves, indicating premeditation. The prosecution alleged that the woman was so angry that James was constantly overspending on the joint account that she devised an entire plan to take his life. The prosecution also called Angela's sister and daughter as witnesses at the trial, who said she confessed to them that she drugged and killed James. Angela's 17-year-old daughter said that when she asked her mother about the horrible smell in the house, she initially lied and said it was a dead rat in the oven. But then she confessed to her and told her what she did to a neighbor, allegedly because he threatened to kill her. Angela stepped up to the podium to testify. She was dressed in black, wearing glasses and her long brown hair. Periodically, she turned to the jury and spoke to them in a shaky voice. She said that she had taken James' life in self-defense, and that she didn't know what her rights were at the time, or she would have reported everything to the police right away. She was afraid that her two children would lose their mother. Angela noted that she tried to preserve some evidence for the police by putting it in plastic bags, such as James' driver's license, which she buried in the park. However, most of the evidence was not preserved, as James' head was never found. Only 56 of the man's bones were able to be found. She went on to say that she used a saw to cut up the body and then, after unsuccessful attempts to burn the limbs, put them in trash bags and scattered them around the neighborhood. Prosecutors argued that Angela slipped sleeping pills into James' drink without his knowledge. The woman's attorney questioned the charges, saying that James knew the sleeping pills were in the drink and that Angela's intention was not to kill him but to keep him away from her two children because she knew that when she told him she would no longer give him money, the man would get angry. Angela also said that as they were sitting in the car, James became upset, grabbed her right shoulder, and began to approach her, threatening to kill her and her children. At this point, Angela reached for the box of camping gear she kept in the back seat and thought she had pulled out a screwdriver. However, it turned out to be an ice axe, which we already know went into the man's eye. Angela also said that James was still holding her, at which point she reached back into the box, grabbed an electrical cord and put it around his neck, taking the man's life. The prosecution then showed a videotape of one of the interviews conducted with Angela at the sheriff's office. In the video, she claimed that after taking James' life, she pulled the ice pick out of his right eye and stuck it in his left eye. However, at the trial, Angela claimed she did not remember doing this and said that after everything that happened, her nightmares mixed with reality, distorting her memories. During cross-examination, the prosecution pointed out how Angela changed her story and lied to investigators who stopped by her home to ask about a neighbor she was probably cooking for at the time. The entire courtroom fell silent when the woman replied that when police knocked on her door, she had already turned off the stove and put James somewhere else. After that confession, the charge against Angela was changed from second-degree murder to first-degree premeditated murder, and the other charges were upheld. The trial ended on December 5, 2014, when Angela was found guilty on all charges. The jury sentenced her to life in prison without parole, and also sentenced her to 15 years for abuse of a dead human body and another five years for tampering with evidence. 
No charges were filed against her children because, according to the prosecution, there was no evidence that they knew they were helping their mother who took their neighbor's life. James' head and torso were never found. What do you think about this horror story? Write your opinion in the comments, as well as subscribe to the channel that would not miss new videos. Take care.